Good day to you. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Peter Alexander here in Washington, and we are watching that breaking news from the White House. In just a few moments, President Biden and Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky are expected to hold a joint news conference following what has been a desperate lobbying effort on Capitol Hill by the Ukrainian leader. The two men huddled in the Oval Office this afternoon, only a short time ago, following an invitation from President Biden. This is part of a last-ditch attempt to get the Ukrainian president to try to help break a stalemate in Congress over wartime aid to his country. With time running out and Russian forces continuing their offensive, President Biden again urging Congress to pass his supplemental funding request while telling Zelensky not to lose hope. Congress needs to pass a supplemental funding for Ukraine before they break uh, the holiday recess, before they give Putin the greatest Christmas gift they could possibly give him. Mr. President, I call on Congress to do the right thing, to stand with Ukraine and to stand up for freedom. And I want to thank you for being here. You're going to help the cause. And I don't want you giving up hope. It's very important for us that we are successful. I think that's very important. That people need to be confident that freedom is secure and strong enough to win. It comes after Zelensky spent his morning there on Capitol Hill meeting with congressional leaders, receiving a notably frostier welcome now compared to his visit almost a year ago. Remember that then? He was given a standing ovation, multiple ovations, before a joint address to Congress and $45 billion in additional aid. But now Republicans are continuing to rebuff the White House's request to pass a sprawling supplemental spending bill that includes assistance for Ukraine, along with aid for Israel, Taiwan, and money to help fortify security at the U.S.-Mexico border. Even after the meeting with Zelensky, Republican leaders and the rank and file have remained steadfast in their demands for significant border policy reforms as part of any security assistance package. Just had a good meeting with President Zelensky. I reiterated to him that we stand with him and against Putin's brutal invasion. Uh, the American people stand for freedom, and they're on the right side of this fight. I have also made very clear from day one that our first condition on any national security supplemental spending package is about our own national security first. What was your message to Zelensky? Uh, you need to thank Mike Johnson for being willing to pass a package if border security is in it, because that's half his conference probably doesn't agree with that. So when you see him thanking, you know, he's being helpful here, Mr. President. I don't give a crap whether he brings Zelensky here or not. Um, you have a fundamental duty to secure the border of the United States, first and foremost. Do it. Chip Roy, Roy, one of the top conservative Republicans right there. And Democrats, meanwhile, have echoed the urgency of Zelensky's rallying cry after their meetings. Here they were. It was a very powerful meeting. President Zelensky made it so clear how he needs help. But if he gets the help, he can win this war. I'm angry and I'm disappointed. Angry that we would consider walking away from Ukraine at this moment in their history. And he said it, if we lose, we can count on occupation by the, the Russians, you can count on guerrilla warfare to resist them, and you can count on massive migration of people out of Ukraine into Europe and beyond. Dick Durbin there. So what comes next for President Biden and President Zelensky set to speak just a few minutes from now as both leaders warn that time is of the essence. And joining me now for this conversation, NBC senior White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell, senior national political reporter Sahil Kapoor. He is on Capitol Hill for us. And we're also joined by Bill Taylor, the former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine and vice president for Russia and Europe at the U.S. Institute of Peace. He also notably met with President Zelensky yesterday ahead of today's high stake meeting. Meetings. Kelly, I want to high stakes meetings. Kelly, I want to get to you uh, as you're at the White House right now. Again, we anticipate this will start about 10 minutes from now. But to set the table for this conversation, you and I both, we have heard the president on repeated occasions make these appeals on why this additional money is needed. But clearly there is stiff resistance from House Republicans, Republicans in Congress in general. Mike Johnson calling for transformative change as it relates to border security, says without border security, you're not going to get the Ukraine money. So what is the backup plan for the White House right now? What is their calculation here? Well, part of the reason the president put together these seemingly disparate types of needs 
border policy and funding with support for Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan, is to try to balance the uh, interests that draw different votes toward those things. And certainly trying to address more money for border spending was intended to try to offset some of the House Republican uh, qualms and concerns about ongoing support for Ukraine. Many in Congress fully support backing Ukraine, but for those who do not, especially on the House uh, Republican side and, and their conference, border funding and border policy is top priority for them, certainly among the top priorities. And so trying to attract them. Now, that has opened up a much more complicated process of negotiation and a wider range, not just a dollar amount, but changes in policy that could be very significant. So for the president, what might have been a tactical move to bring together differing points of view in order to get this supplemental funding passed has now exposed some of the differences in a way that is eating time when time is something that Ukraine certainly has not working in its favor with the wintertime war theater and the uh, supply running short of critical uh, munitions and supplies and equipment. So the conversations between President Biden and President Zelensky are a lot on the same page. The problem is trying to uh, bring together those on Capitol Hill, which is why that portion of the visit was so important for President Zelensky. Peter? Sahil, as you know well, uh, this is getting late fast. I want to talk about the timetable for anything to get done right now. We heard just yesterday from James Langford. He, of course, is the Republican senator from Oklahoma. He's heading up the negotiations on behalf of Senate Republicans on this effort right now. He said it's unlikely anything's going to happen in the course of the next week, which means it's likely nothing happens until January, which is a lot later than the White House says uh, this can go. And frankly, it's a lot later, later than the Ukrainian leaders have said they can handle. We've heard from uh, one of Zelensky's top advisors saying it is a big, big risk. They will lose this war if there is any further delay in funding here. So why wouldn't Congress just stick around right now to try to get something done on this before the holidays come. Well, the short answer, Peter, is that they're nowhere close to a deal, so sticking around would be kind of a moot point when they're not ready to vote on it. Uh, the pessimism is certainly creeping in at this point. The frustrations are growing as the clock ticks. Congress is scheduled to leave town in just two days, and uh, Senator James Langford, the top Republican who's been negotiating uh, this deal, has been among the most optimistic members of Congress I've heard over the last few weeks. That all ended yesterday when he uh, started sounding a whole lot more pessimistic, uh, said they simply don't have time between now and, and uh, the rest of the week to, uh, to reach a deal. I did speak to James Langford earlier today. He said negotiators will continue talking uh, even if and when Congress goes on recess. And in the event that they are close to a deal and have something written and ready to vote on, they can always come back. But they're so far away from that that it's not even part of the conversation. He weighed in on this. Several other key lawmakers weighed in on, on, on this issue today. I want to play what they had to say. There's no way to get it done this week. There's no way to be able to get it done this week. Yeah. The question is, are we staying in it next week, or does this actually move into early January to be able to resolve? Last night, I got on the phone with Speaker Johnson and urged him to keep the House in session, to give a supplemental a chance to come together. If Republicans are serious about getting something done on the border, then why are so many of them in such a hurry to leave for the winter break? It is not the House's issue right now. The issue is with the White House and the Senate. And that last part you just heard from Speaker Mike Johnson, that's important because even if the Senate somehow does agree to a deal in the next few days and is able to pass it through the chamber, there's no guarantee it gets through the Republican-led House where Mike Johnson is under a lot of pressure from his hardliners, like Chip Roy, who he just played, to pass a much more aggressive uh, border and immigration restriction package that has no chance in the Senate. So we're a long, long way off. And uh, Democrats are very, very frustrated, uh, angry. Some of them even look despondent at the fact that the U.S. now looks likely to get to the end of this year and get into early next year, Peter, without passing additional aid to Ukraine. And Sahil, just to be clear on this, if this goes to next year, which it now increasingly appears likely to happen, this is not the only thing on Congress's plate. Obviously, then they'll be right in the heart of a conversation about the other deadline they kick down the road, which is what's called the CR, the continuing resolution, basically the short-term plan to fund the government. They'll have to deal with that as well. Can Congress get all this done in such a short period of time? 
It's certainly doubtful. I mean, it, there's a reason that lawmakers were so eager to get this done this year. There's a reason the White House is so eager to get this off their plate this year. Because, yes, early next year, Congress has a whole lot of things on its plate. It's got to fund the government. It's punted twice. And based on all our reporting and my reporting on the Hill, the next government funding battle in late January, early February is going to be a big one. There's not an appetite to punt again. And the two sides are very, very divided still on which way to go. They've got to deal with things like FISA Section uh, 702. They haven't even figured out a long-term FA a reauthorization and a farm bill. All this stuff is happening while the presidential election is getting underway. Politics creep in, election year uh, factors uh, start to start to kick in. Every one of Donald Trump's social media posts weighs a ton. There's always going to be, you know, the fear that he can just kind of d disrupt a negotiation right. with a single post. All of that, ha all of that kicks in. None of which is to say it's impossible to get an immigration deal. It's just much tougher when you got all these other things taking up oxygen. Ambassador Taylor, I'm getting to you in just a moment. Last question to Kelly before we wait for the president. Kelly, who? who Who's running the show on this issue at the White House right now? I'm curious your thoughts. You and I have both been reporting this out. President Biden has been engaged broadly, but has not been engaged in the nitty gritty of the negotiations, specifically as it relates to border security here. So who's driving the train, as it were? And one of the questions about that is if the president gets more involved, does that help the process or not? And certainly the White House, uh, through its teams, has been doing uh, what's known as technical support, looking at different policies. How would those be carried out operationally? But they have wanted this to be a Senate-focused negotiation with some parameters, certainly, about what would the president be willing to sign. So there has been communication back and forth to know where the president's thinking is and how they can try to close the gap between between what Republicans would like to see and what Democrats would like to see. So there are different uh, levels of outreach and concern about different voting blocks uh, that they have to contend with. But uh, could the president become more publicly involved? Well, this afternoon we may hear him make a more direct appeal on the, the, the numbers, the passage, the urgency. How much that will fold into actual negotiations is another question. So the president has a chance to put a public face on it in just a matter of minutes. Peter? So right now, Kelly, thank you so much. We're going to take you inside the Indian Treaty Room. This is at the Eisenhower Executive Office Building, just across the street from the White House on the campus there, as we see some of the reporters in their positions anticipating the start of this news conference between Presidents Biden and Zelensky. A short time from now, Ambassador Bill Taylor is joining us as well. And Ambassador Taylor, as we wait to hear from the president, I'm struck by the sort of full court press from this administration to try to detail the successes that Ukraine has had to this point. We had some declassified information in the course of the last couple of hours saying that the Russian military has suffered dramatic casualties on the battlefield since February of 2022 when this began, saying there have been at least 315,000 Russian soldiers who have either been killed or wounded here. I ask you that because House Republican Speaker Mike Johnson today said there's still no strategy how to win this war. Is there a strategy to win this war? Is it winnable? for Ukraine, and I guess what does victory look like? Well, Peter, it is winnable. Um, a lot depends, a whole lot depends, and maybe entirely depends on whether they can get the funds from the United States um, and the equipment and the ammunition. That is the key to your question of can they win. They can win. They've tried some things, and they've had some successes that you've just indicated. Uh, early on, they had great success. They, recently, they've had good success on the naval side, on pushing the Russian Navy back out of the part of the Black Sea, enabling the Ukrainians to export, to export, which they couldn't do for a long time. So they've had some success. What they haven't had success on is breaking through the Russian lines. Um, and, and both sides, Peter, both sides have learned uh, that big armored thrusts, big armored tanks, armored personnel carriers, trying to break through the other side, that's not working. Right. So they're changing the idea. They're, they've got other ideas about how to win this war. Let me ask you if I can very quickly. You said uh, we know from you that you met with the, the president, President Zelensky, at the Ukrainian embassy for a period of time yesterday. We've heard his public statements. Is there anything you can share about sort of your private conversations, what you heard from him in those conversations, the level of frustration that Zelensky must be feeling right now? Because in effect, he's been thrust in the middle of what is a, a bitter partisan domestic political battle where it's his country in many ways that's at stake. No, you're exactly right, Peter. And uh, he was, I wouldn't say frustrated. I think he was focused. He was concerned. He's worried. Um, but he is going into the, he went, was going into these conversations uh, last night with some advice from people around that, 
around that room. Some people advised him, uh, you know, Mr. President, you know a lot about borders. You can say something about borders. Other people said, Mr. President, don't get involved in U.S. politics. Hmm. Um, you know, let, let the U.S. politicians deal with that. So he's got he's got he's thinking carefully about how he can make the case for the importance of Ukraine winning um, uh, to the United States. And there is this question about if he doesn't win, that is, if Ukraine loses, Who's responsible? And as I say, the, the the important thing to determine winning and losing is us right now, is the United States' ability to provide them the weapons. Well, and as you know well, it's not just a question of if the U.S. wins or loses. It's a question of what losing would look like if the support dries up and what, you, what Russia does going forward if they uh, pursue this effort, as it were, to expand into the eastern flank of Europe right now. I want to ask you about that specifically. If the U.S. money dries up here, Ambassador Taylor, how much confidence do you have that European countries will continue to help support this effort? So I think they will continue to help. Um, I, and they're already stepping up. They're worried, Peter. I mean, I've heard them say that they're worried about exactly what we're talking about here. That is us not being able to figure out our own politics to provide them with the support. And they're worried about other political changes that could happen. And so they are, the, the Europeans are already working on increasing their capabilities, increasing, they have actually committed, as, you, as you've been reporting, the Europeans have committed more than we have, uh, more than the United States. We do more weapons and we have bigger stockpiles and we've been able to provide more weapons right away. But the Europeans see the problem and they are starting to step up. And I think that is the, that's what they need to do. Can I ask you what one uh, top Republican senator has said? This is J.D. Vance. This is what he said about how he sees this conflict ending. I want to get your reaction. Take a listen first. It ends the way nearly every single war has ever ended when people negotiate and each side gives up something that it doesn't want to give up. No one can explain to me how this ends without some territorial concessions relative to the 1991 battle. If you look at the size of the Russian armed forces, if you look at what would be necessary to conquer all of Ukraine, much less to go further and further west into Europe, I don't think the guy's shown any capacity to be able to accomplish these, these imperialistic goals, assuming that he has them. Is that how this ends? As we've heard from President Biden repeatedly, nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine, which is to say the U.S. is going to let Ukraine make decisions about its own sovereignty, basically saying, as Vladimir Zelensky has said, we're not giving up any land here. But do you see that as a likely scenario about the way that this could end? And would, in effect, that conclusion be satisfactory to the United States in terms of our national interests? It would not. It would not, Peter. Again, if the Ukrainians lose and the Russians are able to take over uh, Ukraine and threaten NATO, then we are in jeopardy. We are vulnerable to, to that, that next conflict, uh, NATO versus Russia. And U.S. soldiers, not employed now, not engaged right now, will be engaged in that next one. So we care a lot about that. But in terms of this question about negotiation, you know, some wars end with victory. A lot of wars end with victory, one side or the other. We can right. think of several types. And, and that is what the Ukrainians are after right now. They do not want to compromise. They're not willing to give up many of their citizens who are living under Russian occupation and the atrocities that they know all too well. They're not willing to give up on those citizens. So they're, they'll say no. They're not, they're not ready to compromise. And they'll continue to fight. Ambassador Bill Taylor, I appreciate your being with us. Thank you to Kelly and Asahil as well. As we just mentioned, we are looking at those live pictures right now from that joint news conference. President Biden and President Zelensky expected to get underway any moment now. We are told they'd be running on time. There are just a few minutes late. We'll keep you very posted on that and bring you there live when it happens. Those remarks should come soon. Again, coming up here, wartime visits to Washington, a broiling border crisis, and oh, by the way, a looming vote to open an impeachment inquiry into President Biden. We are digging deeper into what is shaping up to be a major week in U.S. politics, and it's only Tuesday. The panel is next. Plus, we're going to check in on the other major war occupying Washington's attention with a live report in Tel Aviv after the IDF announced that it found the bodies of two more hostages held by Hamas in Gaza. That plus new reporting about Israel's plans to flood the tunnels, Hamas's tunnels beneath Gaza. What we've learned about how that process is now underway. That's ahead. You're watching Meet the Press now. Thank <laughs> you.
Welcome back at this hour. We are awaiting a joint news conference at the White House with President Biden and Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. We are going to bring that to you just as soon as it happens. President Zelensky's visit here to Washington comes at a moment of division on Capitol Hill, specifically when it relates to additional aid for Ukraine. The divisions, though, are real. They reflect divisions among voters across America. Take a look at this online poll just this month. It says that about half of Americans say that the U.S. is giving too much military and financial aid to Ukraine. And note the partisan split here. See the GOP and the Dems there? More Republicans, about 65% of Republicans say that the U.S. is spending too much. Compare that to Democrats. About 32% of Democrats say that the U.S. is spending uh, too much right now. 39% say the right amount. And joining me is on set Betsy Woodruff-Swan, the national correspondent for Politico, former Florida Democratic Congresswoman Stephanie Murphy, and former Florida Republican Congressman and NBC News political analyst Carlos Corbello is here as well. All right, guys, we're all together until the president speaks, so I appreciate your patience and understanding on that. Betsy, let me ask you quickly about this right now. I'm struck by the number about Republicans. The divide in this country were Republicans. About two-thirds of them say that we are spending too much, the U.S. is, on Ukraine right now. So what is the incentive for Republicans to budge on this issue? It's it's minimal. And the easiest way to predict where a Republican politician is going to come down on aid to Ukraine is how sensitive they are to the Republican base, which is why when you look at the Senate, many of these very powerful key senators like Mitch McConnell are really, really pro-Ukraine because they just aren't that worried about the base. But if you look, of course, at House Republicans, especially this sort of new vanguard of very hard right, far right House Republicans, they're the ones that are the most critical of Ukraine, the most aggressively skeptical about continued support. And J.D. Vance, who, of course, is having his name batted around as a potential running mate to Trump in his reelection bid. The fact that he's going out and talking very openly openly and candidly about real deep skepticism about, about further Ukraine aid, there's, there's no question whatsoever that uh, that is very much advanced reflecting where the Republican base is at. So where the base is moved to is also where so many of these lawmakers are moved to. And parked comfortably in that base is Speaker Mike Johnson, of course, the new House Speaker, the Republican from Louisiana. And Congressman Corbella, I just want your take on this right now. Clearly, the Republicans feel like they've got a pretty good hand right here, right? They feel like, hey, Americans widely are waning in terms of their support of Ukraine. We, we support Ukraine, they will say, but we're going to get everything we can on border security here. Are they pushing too far on this? And where is that line? Where can they satisfy winning on both sides? Well, Peter, politically, they're not pushing too far because they need an issue for the Republican base. They need an excuse to support this package. While the Republican base may not support funding Ukraine, they certainly support stronger border security and border enforcement. So that's why Speaker Johnson, who does support Ukraine aid, is trying to nego negotiate something that will give his members a reason to support this package. I think the Biden administration is keenly aware of this as well, which is why the president said out loud a few days ago that he's open to negotiating on immigration because he knows he needs it if this package is going to get through. Congresswoman Murphy, right now, was it a mistake for the president, for the White House, to put border security and Ukraine together in this supplemental package? Because effectively, I... I I would argue, perhaps, based on conversations I've had, the White House doesn't think it could have got Ukraine passed alone. December 22nd, the last time any aid was passed to Ukraine, right? So they believe under the House Republicans' leadership this never would have happened. But was this a mistake, and has it empowered the, Repu the Republicans in the House? You know, this is a technique that this White House has employed before, tying one um, very disparate bill to another. I mean, if you think about the way they got infrastructure and the Build Back Better, which eventually became the Inflation Reduction Act, all tangled up because they... they tied right. them together. I think it's really hard when you tie two different subjects together. Because if a bill is good enough, then it should be able to pass on its own merits. And so they've got themselves in this situation, but they do need both bills to pass. The White House needs this national security supplemental to pass because the president currently, based on polling, looks weak on national security, um, both foreign and domestic. And the American people care about what's going on at the border. And it's critically important for him and for the Democrats to get something done here. But it's looking like that chance is really starting to fade this year. And so I just want to get your take on that, Congressman. So right now you got the Republicans are saying, hey, we're going to hold out on this. We're going to go for a little bit 
on this. It means we could be going into January. We've heard from the top advisor, Andre Yermak, the top advisor, the chief of staff to President Zelensky, saying we are at a big risk of losing this war if it goes that far. Where is the disconnect for people watching this conversation among sort of the base of Republicans in this country? Why don't they worry that supporting Ukraine right now or failing to support Ukraine right now would backfire? At the end of the day, this war spreads into Eastern Europe. Those are NATO allies, and then U.S. troops are on the ground fighting this war. Well, Peter, some Republicans are worried. Uh, Chairman McCall, chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, as soon as the White House put out this funding package, he endorsed it because he knows how precarious the situation is for the Ukrainian military. Now, having said that, politics is all about leverage, and Republicans understand that they hold the leverage right now, and they want to push the White House as much as possible to get the best deal they can on immigration so they can go to their base and sell it to them. And also, they know immigration's a weakness for this White House, and they want that issue to be as prominent as possible. Betsy, the backdrop to this whole conversation is what is very rapidly becoming a campaign year. We're only a matter of weeks away. Iowa, not that far away from right now. Donald Trump, the prohibitive favorite on the Republican side right now. If this stuff doesn't get done soon, and then you got to deal with a short-term spending plan, they got to resolve government spending pretty soon. How likely is it that anything gets done in the calendar year of 2024? We're running up against the clock, not just for Ukraine, but for our ability to function as a government broadly going forward. There's no doubt. And I think it's long been sort of an old saw that Congress can't do anything important or interesting in presidential election years. And increasingly, even in midterm election years, couple that with the fact that this is going to be one of the most tense and strange presidential election cycles, I think, in uh, modern history without debate. Uh, the likelihood that members of Congress will be able to negotiate with Biden, the likelihood that Mike Johnson and the House Republican Conference would give Biden some sort of victory just seems very, very, very low. You know, obviously, you never want to say never on these things, particularly when it comes to issues where there's broad support like government funding. Uh, but in general, just as a matter of the laws of physics and how they operate mm -hmm. in Washington, the odds of anything big or ambitious happening in calendar year 2024 are not high. Yeah, I, I struggled with physics in high school, but as it relates to what happens in Washington, I think all Americans get that one pretty clearly at this point. Congresswoman, I want to get to you specifically on this. We were talking about President Biden and some of the challenges he's faced as it relates to the views Americans have of him on specifically the issue of foreign policy here. On the economy, Americans are concerned. Inflation is still a real issue. On foreign policy, it's a concern. And what strikes me is that you have this president who, in many ways, his political future is hanging on by two wars, at least as foreign policy relates, where the U.S. is not a party to either of them. He has very little control about the outcome in either place. How does he turn around Americans' views of his handling of this? A lot of Democrats would say he kept NATO together. Consider where we'd be without this. You know, both the White House as well as Democrats have to do a better job communicating to the American people and answering the question that they're hearing from constituents, which is, we have so many issues at home, why are you spending money abroad? And they have yet to be able to articulate the why. And that is, I, and I think the fact that you see a third of Democrats also thinking that we're spending too much money in Ukraine as a serious warning sign for the Biden administration. So they've got to be able to lead on this and we haven't quite seen it yet. The irony is today there are some numbers as it relates to inflation, inflation going in the right direction, wages now higher than inflation. It's good news. It may not matter to a lot of people who have still been struggling with this for the course of the last several years. But are, these are the kind of headlines the White House wish we were talking about. Instead, yeah. it's yeah. swamped by other topics but that we're focused on. Those macroeconomic numbers really don't mean anything to anybody outside of the Beltway. What happens at home in Central Florida kitchens is, can I afford to pay for my kids X, Y, or Z? What kind of Christmas or holiday season is my family going to have? What is the price of groceries? What is the price of gasoline? And we haven't really seen real movement on that, despite the macroeconomic numbers. And this White House... Well, gasoline is, is now down, down, you know, down significantly mm -hmm. from where it was before. But you're right. Broadly speaking, for a lot of Americans, these remain key issues. Well, yeah. Peter, and I agree with Stephanie, because it's not just the year-over-year -year numbers, but there was a, a long period where there was significant inflation, and people still haven't adjusted to those new prices. And as long as there's this feeling or sentiment of scarcity at home, when you see all these billions of dollars going overseas, you can understand how some Americans might recoil and say, why are we spending all this money when we're struggling? So, Betsy, how does the White House do a better job of that? I cover the White House for a living, right? I mean, in the first two years, you talk about a trillion dollars 
in infrastructure, right? They focus on the word implementation now. You got to show people these things are being built. Bridges don't go up overnight, but that was significant. You talk about CHIPS Act, the idea to try to fix the supply chain so we're not so reliant on China. You talk about $600 billion, the largest spending ever uh, by the United States on the issue of climate change. But to most Americans, they don't even know these things happened, frankly. So it is in many ways. I know people think the media may focus too much on messaging, but they do face a messaging challenge to make people understand this, even if they're not feeling it. And ultimately, how they feel may just dictate the day. And, and it's virtually impossible for politicians in Washington to persuade people that they have more money in their bank accounts than yeah, they think they do, exactly. or that food costs less than it does. But how do they sell the opportunity cost? And this is a conversation, right? Like right now, the White House is trying to lean a little bit harder into the contrast with President, former President Trump right now. After the abortion issue we saw in Texas, they said this is what Trump's America would look like. It's a lot harder to say to Americans, hey, you think it's tough now. Imagine what it would have been like, right? That's a tough sell. Right. And the converse to that is that Trump loves talking about that all over the campaign trail what he says over and over is when I was president there wasn't war in Ukraine when I was president this attack didn't happen in Israel as a factual matter that's correct and it's extremely challenging for the Biden White House to say this four-year period is different from the four-year period when Trump was was in charge and if he'd won a second uh, second term in office things would have been different once if you're if you're in the Biden White House right now defending Biden's foreign policy record involves a whole bunch of hypotheticals and the more hypothetical you get the harder it is to persuade regular voters that that especially, you're doing better than your predecessor especially when those hypotheticals are put up against very clear visuals. So starting with the Afghanistan withdrawal, seeing people fall from the skies in desperation as America withdrew in a very disorganized way, watching the horrific videos from October 7th and watching the awful videos from the war in Ukraine. I mean, I remember when Zelensky came to Congress the first time and presenting those images, and it brought me to tears to see the suffering. And so those are very clear images. They're constant. Hunting them, putting them up against a hypothetical, it's really hard to, to win that argument. But you talk about those images. Why don't those images now resonate? Have we somehow become callous to some of the images we're seeing right now, right? What's happening in Ukraine? Like, we've now been distracted by what's happening in Israel, which is its own awful situation. That the situation in Ukraine to a lot of Americans is like, hey, we can only deal with so much right now. Well, I think Americans are also dealing with the images from home, right? Uh, crime uh, being up in a lot of cities, um, what they are seeing at their own kitchen tables. Um, and at the end of the day, a lot of uh, voters, they very seldomly come and vote on foreign policy issues. They right. usually show up and vote on economic and security, domestic security issues. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. I appreciate you. Stick with us, Congressman. I appreciate you guys being with us. Thanks to all of you. We're going to try to do more of this because we are still waiting for that joint news conference with President Biden and President Zelensky to get underway. We call this tap dancing in the business. We're going to bring you his remarks as soon as they happen. But coming up next, we do want to give you the latest on the new fallout in Israel's war against Hamas as Israeli forces continue their offensive with new calls for a ceasefire intensifying globally. We're going to take you live to Tel Aviv for the very latest. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. We are turning back now to the war between Israel and Hamas and renewed scrutiny facing Israeli forces as they continue their military assault in Gaza. Just moments ago, the United Nations voted to adopt a draft resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. And at a reception today here just outside Washington, President Biden warned Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu that Israel was losing international support, he said, because of what he called the indiscriminate bombing taking place and that its approach, Israel's approach in Gaza, had to change. It comes after last night, President Biden reiterated his support for Israel at the White House Hanukkah celebration, calling himself a Zionist and stating that there would not be a Jew in the world who felt safe if there was not an Israel. Meanwhile, a U.S. official tells NBC News that the Israeli military has begun pumping seawater into tunnels under Gaza in limited areas. I just got this information from a source I was speaking to a short time ago. This official says that it is not clear in the U.S.'s view if Israel's effort will be effective and, frankly, how widespread Israel is committed to being with this strategy. We are joined now by NBC's Hallie Jackson, again, who made her way to Tel Aviv several days ago. And, Hallie, I want to get first to that United Nations General Assembly. The 
that just voted to adopt a, a ceasefire resolution. We expect most U.N. countries, obviously, to stand against the U.S. in calling for a ceasefire. Does that stand have any impact on the ground there? What is the latest out of Gaza? It appears like there is, there is no appetite on either side to try to calm down and, and trade hostages at this point. Israel just barreling ahead. So you've, it's a lot of interesting threads there, Peter, all of which are having an impact on the ground. And if we start with the United Nations vote there, listen, you know this, it is symbolic, right? There's not actual teeth to it, but it is an indication of the way that the U.S. and Israel are kind of on an island in the international community on this front, facing that pressure for a ceasefire. The, the U.S. has consistently said that is not a policy position they'd support. There's that controversial U.N. Security Council vote just on Friday that made that even more clear. But what's also interesting here, Peter, when you look at the diplomatic Front is the way that even as the U.S. and Israel are resisting that pressure, there is daylight, there is distance, right, between the U.S. and Israel on what happens after this war. You mentioned the new comments from President Biden, significant as this is the biggest gap. It's, it feels like the biggest gap between these two leaders at this level since the war began. But we've also heard here in Israel today from Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who is acknowledging that there is real disagreement with the United States, with the administration about what happens as Netanyahu put it, the day after Hamas, right, after this war is done. And that has been the question really since October 7th. You talked about, listen, part of the issue here, too, is the humanitarian crisis that's happening in Gaza. You talked about the situation there. One of the things that the United States wants to do, as you well know, Peter, from talking to your sources in the White House about this, is boost the amount of aid that can get in through the Karem Shalom border crossing, a different one than Rafa, which has been the main point, the only point in and out from Gaza into Egypt. The United States, while that is open now for inspections, wants to see it go even further, right? Wants aid trucks to be able to go in and out to U.N. distribution sites through that crossing to accelerate the food and the water and the medicine to people who so desperately need it in Gaza. We have heard again and again, and I've talked with people here. I talked with one uh, aid leader who was just in Gaza who described people just hungry. They're just starving, talking to families who are doling out water little by little. We're seeing these images of people lining up to get sacks of flour, lining up to get any food they can get their hands on, with new estimates now that really only about one in every three hospitals, according to officials uh, and some of these international aid, aid organizations, are even partially functioning, Peter. So that's the reality uh, on the ground in Gaza. The reality on the ground in Israel, of course, and I spoke with a member of the uh, 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 a minister just yesterday, and we were talking about what happens next after the war. We were talking about the, the mission, the goal here, as Israel sees it, they are going to pursue these strikes. Their stated goal, of course, is to wipe out Hamas, they say. They have said that all along. That has been the line from the very beginning. The hostage release is a question mark here, because right now it feels like talks are at a standstill. There's really not much to point to that is concrete to move that forward to get some of these hostages out, even as you are seeing officials internationally say, hey, we are still pushing forward on the diplomatic front there, Peter. Listen, I wouldn't be surprised as we're waiting for President Biden probably any minute. Obviously, the focus on the Ukrainian president wouldn't be surprised if maybe he got a question or two about what's happening here. Another war that is making headlines tonight, Peter. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. If I were in that room, I suspect like you, one of the questions would be about the president's latest comments as they relate to Bibi Netanyahu, the prime minister of Israel right now. We'll be watching with you, Hallie, when that begins a short time from now. Thank you so much. And after the break, the former president and his cell phone in court as special counsel Jack Smith lays out part of his trial strategy in the criminal election interference case against former President Trump. We're going to have the latest legal developments. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. You're watching Meet the Press now. And as we await word on whether the Supreme Court will weigh in on whether Donald Trump has presidential immunity in his federal election interference case, we now know some of the evidence that special counsel Jack Smith will present if that case proceeds. In a court filing late yesterday, Smith revealed that he plans to use data from Mr. Trump's White House cell phone. Specifically, the special counsel intends on calling as many as three expert witnesses to pinpoint the former president's whereabouts on January 6th, as well as how Mr. Trump's phone was used on and around that date. NBC News Justice and Intelligence Correspondent Ken Delaney is joining me now with the latest on this. Ken, this is interesting. What does it uh, appear to say, to show... Uh, that Jack Smith is uh, going to try to do here? What is the strategy? What is he hoping to demonstrate with these cell phone records? 
Well, first, big picture, it's a remarkable demonstration of the breadth of evidence that Smith has and the precision of the evidence. So in this case, what he's saying is that one expert in particular is going to be able, has extracted data to show exactly how those phones, the phones of, of former President Trump and another individual unnamed, were used on and around January 6th, including when it was unlocked and on the Twitter application, what messages were sent. There's also a reference to imagery on the phones. Again, a lot we don't know. It's unclear. And there are some caveats here. For example, uh, does Jack Smith have a witness that can establish that it was, in fact, Donald Trump using the phone and not Dan Scavino or some other aid? And was any of the data on the phone protected by executive privilege or encrypted or uh, inaccessible by other means? But nonetheless, it's, it's, it's got to be a pretty frightening thought uh, for anybody, really, but a, a, a defendant being prosecuted to know that the prosecution has your phone, which is often a roadmap to almost everything you're doing. So, Ken, what picture is Smith trying to paint here right now? Basically, what would location data help prove in terms of Mr. Trump's actions before and after, before and during the attack? I think the location data is less important. That's more about people moving from the ellipse uh, to the Capitol area. It. Because it's not going to tell you, for example, which room he was in in the White House. But remember when Kristen Welker asked Donald Trump on Meet the Press to account for what he was doing while the riot was unfolding on January 6th, he refused to answer. And there are a lot of gaps in our knowledge about exactly what he was doing. We have testimony from some aides who said he was watching a lot of it unfold on TV. But what I think the main thing that he, Smith is trying to accomplish here is to establish with precision and with evidence exactly what he was doing at certain times. You may not get the whole picture, but at certain times uh, of that, while the riot was unfolding, who he was texting, when he was tweeting, what he was reading, uh, on his phone. So that will be important evidence. So based on what we know now, when should we anticipate this could happen, this interference, election interference case? Trials. So obviously we have these appeals going to the Supreme Court. You know, it may delay things. My money is still on a trial. It may not be March, which is the current plan, but mid, mid next year. Uh, the Justice Department is doing everything it can, Jack Smith is, to get this case to trial well before the November election. We'll see if they succeed. Peter. All right, Ken Delaney, and thank you for your expertise and your reporting on that. We appreciate it very much. We do want to turn now from Donald Trump's looming criminal trial to his ongoing civil fraud trial in New York with the former president's defense resting its case today. Mr. Trump's lawyers wrapping up their case without their client testifying again as planned. NBC News correspondent Von Hilliard has more on what is ahead in that trial. Right, Peter, the defense resting their case today after the New York Attorney General's prosecutor was able to ask questions of one of the defense witnesses, that being an accounting professor from NYU who was called to the stand by Trump's defense team last week. It's notable that this witness was paid nearly $900,000 by the Trump Organization and a Trump-aligned super PAC to provide his testimony. And so today on the stand, you heard from the New York Attorney General prosecutor asking this witness rebuttal questions to try to poke holes into the testimony he provided in defense of Donald Trump and the Trump Organization last week. Now, there are two other witnesses who we expect to take the stand, called by the defense here in the coming days, before ultimately the trial uh, is put on hold uh, up until January 11th of 2024. That is when the two sides have been called on to present their closing arguments in front of the judge in Lower Manhattan. Again, this is a, 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 a situation in which we are watching the political and the legal run perpendicular to one another for Donald Trump. Of course, January 11th, when those closing arguments will be presented is just four days before January 15th when Donald Trump will face voters for the first time in the Iowa caucuses. For Donald Trump and his defense team, uh, they have already been ruled against on one of the claims in which the judge found uh, Donald Trump and the Trump Organization to have committed uh, repeatedly fraud, but the judge will ultimately determine uh, his ruling on six other claims brought forward by the New York Attorney General's office, as well as determine the financial penalties and potential the future of the Trump Organization's uh, ability to hold a business license in New York State. So there's much on the line for Donald Trump here in these closing days and ahead of those closing arguments on January 11th. Peter? Vaughn Hilliard, we appreciate your reporting there. Vaughn, thanks so much. And still to come right here, new fallout of the fight for an emergency abortion in the state of Texas. 
An emergency abortion there after a pregnant woman was forced to flee the state to abort her fatally ill fetus. Details on the state's Supreme Court decision and the implications. That's after this break. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. We turned out of the latest developments after the Texas Supreme Court ruled last night against a Texas woman's request for an emergency abortion to end her high-risk pregnancy just hours after she left the state to receive abortion care elsewhere. Her name is Kate Cox. She's a Dallas-area mother of two. Uh, she sought and ultimately was initially granted an exception to the state's strict abortion ban after she learned that her fetus has a rare fatal condition, one that would have an impact on her future health and fertility. But the Supreme Court vacated the lower court's decision, ruling that Cox's doctor did not prove that her condition rose to the level of an exception, writing, quote, some difficulties in pregnancy, however, even serious ones, do not pose the heightened risks to the mother the exception encompasses. The Center for Reproductive Rights, which is representing Cox here, reacted to the decision saying, in part, quote, if Kate cannot get an abortion in Texas, who can? Kate's case, they say, is proof that exceptions do not work and it's dangerous to be pregnant in any state with an abortion ban. NBC News senior legal correspondent and my colleague on Saturday mornings on Today, Laura Jarrett, is joining me now to break down this court's Ruling, Laura, we've been talking about this for the course of the last week. You spoke to Kate Cox at one point uh, last week as well. Break down the court's latest ruling here. Does this change precedent at all for women seeking exceptions to the state's strict ban? Hey, Peter. So on the one hand, the high court here in Texas is saying that the decision about whether or not uh, someone meets that medical exception is really up to the doctor. The state is saying a woman does not need to be on death's doorstep in order to qualify. That's on the uh, one hand. On the other, they're saying in the case of Kay Cox, who has in the last month been to the emergency room no less than four times, her doctor, in this case, Peter, they're saying didn't actually follow the way that the statute is written. And what the statute says is that someone has to have a life-threatening physical condition. And because the doctor didn't spell it out in those words exactly, the court is saying in this case, she doesn't qualify. But they don't say in what case would someone qualify, Peter? It's remarkable how lawmakers uh, and others could sort of engage in this in this process in this way. Are doctors themselves concerned that they could face severe penalties if the state, if a state like Texas decides that they made the wrong call and ultimately goes after them? Absolutely, and I think it's part of what factored in here because remember, Kate Cox had an order in her hand that said she could get this emergency abortion from a state court judge totally authorized to do that. And yet, in spite of that court order, the attorney general of Texas, Ken Paxton, sent a letter to three hospitals and said, if you do that procedure, you are on our watch list and you are subject to civil and criminal penalties. And I think that had a big factor in why she wasn't able to get that abortion in the intervening time between when she had a court order and when the Supreme Court put a stay on that court and, order. And to be clear, in, in all of this, Laura, I was just going to say, Kate Cox is fortunate to have the resources, the means to be yes. able to go to another state to be able to pursue the, the abortion that her doctor says she needs. There are so many uh, women in this country, many of them black and brown women in particular, who do not have the resources to do that. Specific to Cox, do we have any update on her condition today? Has she been able to receive the care that she needs? All we know is that she had to go out of state for it, Peter. We're working hard to try to follow up with her while also trying to respect her privacy and recognizing what she's been through in the last week. Uh, but I think there's more to come on this. As the group that's representing her told me, they are fielding calls from other women right now, Peter. And I want to ask you, maybe we go back and forth on this because you cover a lot of the legal side, I cover a lot of the political side, but you and I have had a lot of conversations about this. And I've been struck about the impact that this issue has had uh, as it relates to, to the voters nationwide, how motivated this issue, motivating this issue has been mm. nationwide. We've heard from Democrats in particular trying to put the issue of abortion access on the ballot in states like Montana, a state where the Democrat senator, the John Tester, faces a real challenge. In the conversations you're having right now with those in around this issue, how motivated are they to sort of fight on this 
issue as the 2024 campaign ramps up? I think what's striking the most, Peter, is that most people don't necessarily know all the nitty gritty of the rules. They sort of loosely following the back and forth. They understand that Roe is no more. But until they're actually faced with the decision to try to seek out an abortion like Kate Cox was, she said she was shocked to learn that she could not qualify for a medical exception. And so, as you say, I think Democrats are using this. We see Vice President Harris talking about this case today. We've seen the Biden campaign using it. We've seen uh, Governor Whitmer talking about this. And so I think you're going to hear more and more, more and more, especially as more and more cases come out. Remember, it's not the case you usually have someone who is actively pregnant seeking a court order, as we have seen this week. Yeah, this is a remarkable case, and it's not one that's ended just yet. We're going to keep a close eye on it. I know you will, Laura. I appreciate it. We'll see you live on Saturday, on Saturday today. And we want to thank you at home for being with us this hour. Let's take you back to the Indian Treaty Room. This is at the White House right now. You can see this live picture as we prepare for both President Zelensky and President Biden uh, to join this room on the right side of the scene. And you can see in the front row some of the delegation members, including the Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, there in anticipation of this to begin soon. The news continues with Tom Costello in for Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.